Thank you for joining us at uh, Talks with Google. Today we have uh, renowned theoretical physicist Sean Carroll, and he will be talking about his new book, The Biggest Ideas in the Universe. Thank you, Quentin. Thanks, uh, everyone, for having me. This is a, a new thing for me, giving a talk on the East Coast. I was on the West Coast uh, before this summer and have frequently been at Google, uh, both in uh, near LA and in the northern parts of California. Now I'm speaking to you from Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, and I don't know where you all are. I don't know if you're all in New York or you're all somewhere around the world, but the good news is what I'm talking about is universal. You do not need to be uh, in any physical location to follow along with this, uh, coming from this book that I recently published, The Biggest Ideas in the Universe. There are too many big ideas. The book is about all sorts of ideas in classical physics. So I picked one for this talk and I figured I would pick the biggest idea that I could finally, that I could put my finger on, which was Einstein's equation. Now I know that depending on your physics background, you probably think you've heard of Einstein's equation. E equals mc squared is extremely famous, maybe the most famous equation in physics, but this is not what professional physicists refer to as Einstein's equation. That equation is this one. This one you probably have not heard of, again, depending on what your physics background is, but this equation, you could easily get a bachelor's degree or in many cases, a PhD in physics and never come across. This is Einstein's field equation for general relativity, his theory of space-time curvature and gravity. If I were to read the equation out loud, it would say r mu nu minus one half r g mu nu equals eight pi g t mu nu. So you can kind of see why it is not very much embedded in the popular imagination. It looks intimidating. There's all sorts of symbols. There are subscripts. The subscripts are in Greek. We don't know what anything means. And so people don't want to go through the effort of unpacking what this equation is trying to tell us. Well, you've come to the right place. If you would like to have all of that unpacked, this is exactly what we're going to do. And I know that you know this might not be what you signed up for. Uh, Equations are not usually what are focused on in popular level talks about physics, but don't worry about it. This is going to be okay. Some of you might be super duper mathematically sophisticated. Maybe the physics parts of this will be okay. But I do think that even if you're not super duper comfortable with mathematics, everyone can understand this level of physics, not to the level where you would solve equations and, and do professional work in general relativity, but you can understand the ideas. That is the motivating principle behind this book. All you need is a steady guide. So you should think of yourself as Dante and me as Virgil, I'm the steady guide. These uh, people down here trying to get on your boat, these are the equations that we will encounter in the, in the talk. Don't worry about them. I'm gonna protect you from them. Everything is going to be okay. So let's start slowly with an equation from Isaac Newton. Again, the book covers what we call classical mechanics, basically Aristotle through Newton through Einstein, including relativity theory. But this is what you would learn first if you were a uh, physics undergraduate taking physics courses. F equals MA is the foundational equation for classical mechanics. And it's pretty simple to understand. Force equals mass times acceleration. If you have an object of a certain mass and you want to move it, you push on it with a certain force and it accelerates in a way that follows this equation. And this is an extremely powerful equation. You know, the old joke uh, for physics undergraduates is you can forget all the other equations and derive everything from F equals MA. Why is it so important and interesting? Well, for one thing, it's an equation. And I, and I don't want to undersell this. Uh, this is the language in which modern physics is written, equations. And equations means that you have something that is absolutely precise. This is not just a statement in words that the more you push on something, the faster it will accelerate, okay? This is a very precise statement that if you push twice as hard on exactly the same thing, it will accelerate by twice as much. Or if something is half of the mass of something else, the same force will cause it to accelerate by twice as much. And that's just an extremely helpful thing to be that precise. It lets you not only understand the idea, but to actually pilot a rocket ship and get it to the moon. You don't need general relativity to go to the moon. New Newtonian physics is more than good enough. Of course, the second thing that's important is that this is not just a mathematical equation, it's a law of physics. And what that means is it's universal. It's not just there was one time I exerted a force on something and it accelerated. 
This says every time in the universe that you exert a force on something, if Newtonian physics had been exactly correct, which it's not quite, but to the extent that it's accurate, that thing will accelerate in a way that obeys this equation. So you can kind of see the central importance of this equation. This is relating what we do to things to how they move in the universe. That is going to be a crucially important central concept. There's a little subtlety in this equation, because if you look closely, the F and the A have arrow signs on top of them, indicating they're not just numbers, but vectors. They have both a magnitude and a direction. So if you imagine writing those vectors as components in the X direction, Y direction, Z direction, then each component obeys F in the X direction is M times A in the X direction, et cetera. There's really three equations embedded in this simple set of symbols. That's going to be something, that idea that we can embed multiple relationships into a single equation. It's going to be very, very useful very, very soon. Another equation we need, if we want to get things off the ground, and another thing that was done by Isaac Newton in his masterwork, Principia Mathematica, is to give a specific example of a force, okay? So F equals MA, Newton's second law of motion says, any force acting on an object of mass M will accelerate it by that much. But to actually solve some equations, you need to tell me what the force is. So a famous force is the force of gravity. And it was Newton who quantified how that worked with his famous inverse square law of gravity. So imagine you have some object M that is exerting a gravitational force on an object, I should say an object with mass, capital M. It's exerting a force on a smaller object with mass, little m, in the direction of this unit vector, E, and the distance between them is R. Then Newton's law of universal gravity says that the force due to gravity is in the direction of that vector, and it's proportional to capital M and little m divided by the square of the distance between them. So the gravitational force is relatively strong when you're nearby, relatively weak when you're far away. You can do this. You can use this equation, plug it in, relate it to the um, force example that we have in F equals MA, and then get a relationship for the acceleration due to gravity. This is exactly what Newton was able to use to predict, for example, that planets move in ellipses. Kepler had already established that planets do move in ellipses. Newton explained to us why. If you have planets moving under an inverse square law of gravity, they will move in ellipses. So this was a huge triumph for, the for theoretical physics and for observational astronomy in their early days, a quantitative relationship that predicted something that was already known to be true. And also the fact that we have equations here lets us home in on an extremely interesting feature of gravity that will come back to be very important to us when we hit general relativity. So let's do exactly what I said we should do. We have F equals MA. We also have F equals G MM over R squared times the unit vector. So let's set them equal. And you notice we can do a little bit, bit of math to these. There's a little m in this part of the equation. There's a little m in this part of the equation. We can divide by little m on both sides and they just go away, they cancel out. So really what you're saying is that the acceleration due to gravity is Newton's constant of gravitation. That's what capital G is, just a constant everywhere in the universe, times the mass of the object doing the pulling divided by the distance to that object squared. And what you notice is the actual mass of the thing falling appears nowhere in this equation. If you're going to believe this story about Newtonian gravity, uh, heavy objects don't fall any faster or, or any differently than light objects. If you, if you drop a hammer and a feather, they should fall at exactly the same rate. Now, if any of you have ever dropped a hammer and a feather, you know they don't fall exactly at the same rate. That's why Newton was a genius, because he was able to see past this. In fact, it was sort of Galileo, who was the relevant genius here, who realized that the reason why hammers and feathers in the real world fall at different rates is not because of gravity, but because of air resistance. It's easy to know that you know if you drop a feather, there will be air resistance, but the genius was to say, I can imagine a situation without air resistance, and then the mass won't matter. So this experiment was finally done and during Apollo 15, when the astronauts really did drop a hammer and a feather, and you can see them fall at the same rate. So what is this telling us? What does this mean for the force of gravity? It means something really provocative. 
If you drop an electrically charged particle in an electric field, how it moves will depend a lot on the features of the particles. Is it positively charged? Is it negatively charged? Is it neutral? Whatever. But gravity isn't like that. Gravity says that every object falls at the same rate. This is very special. Gravity is unlike other forces. What is up with that? And so Newton noticed this and he said, that's curious. He didn't know what to make of it. But eventually we figured it out because of this guy, Albert Einstein. So we're going to skip over a couple centuries. Newton was in the 1600s. The beginning of the 1900s, we saw the invention of special relativity. Okay, so in 2005, there's special relativity in, in sorry, 1905, not 2005. In 1905, we have special relativity, which 10 years later would evolve into general relativity, Einstein's even bigger and more impressive theory. But the first theory, 1905, Einstein is a pretty young guy at the time. He was doing other miraculous things that same year. But what Einstein really did about relativity was put the capstone on a set of ideas that had been percolating around for a long time. In the 1800s, we'd understood electromagnetism through the work of James Clark Maxwell and other people. And it seemed to have a special role for something called the speed of light. It was Maxwell's equations that really showed us once and for all that what light is, is a wave in the electrical and magnetic fields, but the speed of light had to play some special role. And that was weird because we had this idea that all motion should be relative, that there's no such thing as the absolute speed. There's only the relative motion the two different things passing by would measure between each other. So what Einstein figured out how to do was to reconcile those ideas at the same time. Motion is relative, it is not absolute, but at the same time, the speed of light is the same for everybody. That is absolute. How can you possibly have both of those things being true? All you have to do is dramatically modify your notions of how space and time work. So that's what leads to all of these puzzles and paradoxes about length contraction and time dilation and all those other things. They're all fun, they're all important. We're not gonna dig into them in any detail here. Rather, what we're going to do is note that it really wasn't until two years later that I would say that we really figured out what special relativity was trying to tell us. And that came not from Einstein, but from his old math professor at university, Herman Minkowski. So Minkowski had been following along Einstein's progress. You know, he knew about special relativity, but he was a mathematician at heart. And Einstein really was not. Einstein was good at math, but he was a physicist at heart. And Minkowski was the one who said, look, I can think of a more elegant mathematical formulation of your theory. So Albert, you've done well, but I, I think that there's a better way of thinking about it, which is imagine that we've unified space and time into a single four-dimensional space-time with a unique kind of geometry, which we now call Minkowski space-time, by the way. And Minkowski says, if you think about things that way, everything in special relativity makes sense. His famous quote is that henceforth space by itself and time by itself are doomed to fade away into mere shadows and only a kind of union of the two will preserve an independent reality. Someone who was not impressed with this perspective on the problem was Albert Einstein. Einstein wrote a paper soon thereafter where he says he sort of complains. Minkowski's formulation makes rather great demands on the reader in its mathematical aspects. So Einstein's complaint is that, look, we have the physics. We understand what's going on. Why are you complicating it with this mathematical story? But as is often the case, something that looks like unnecessary mathematical formalism can actually be of huge use when it comes to improving the theory that you have in front of you. And this is exactly what happens with special relativity. So let's be a little bit more quantitative about what Minkowski was actually saying. He's saying that not only we have space time, you should think of space and time as unified, but there's a novel geometry on space time that explains why we tend to think of space and time as separate. Here's what we mean by that. What do I mean by a geometry? Well, space all by itself has a geometry. That's the geometry we learn about in high school. In particular, if space is flat or if you're working on a tabletop or something like that, we have Euclidean geometry. And in Euclidean geometry, we can measure the distance along a path. 
and there's formulas for what it is. So here's a person out for a run and they're counting their steps on the pedometer. And if they know how far their steps are, they can figure out their distance. That's great. But sometimes you don't have your pedometer with you, but maybe you can keep track of your coordinates. This is a thought experiment. This is not very realistic, but in principle, Pythagoras's theorem gives you a formula for calculating the distance along a straight line in some coordinate systems. So you have coordinates X and Y, maybe it's like the streets of Manhattan, okay? There's a grid at right angles. And if you know that you've traveled in some diagonal path and you know what your X displacement is and your Y displacement, Pythagoras's theorem says that D, the distance you've moved, is the hypotenuse of a right triangle. So its distance is D squared is X squared plus Y squared. That's something we learn in high school. It's part of Euclidean geometry. Minkowski's insight is that the time that you measure when you're moving through space time is exactly or almost exactly like the distance you measure when you're moving through space. Instead of something to keep track of your distance or your steps, you have a clock. The clock keeps track of how much time you personally have experienced. And what Einstein and then Minkowski later said is, the time that you personally experienced is not universal. It is not a once and for all absolute feature of the cosmos. You can put a time coordinate on the universe. You can say, when someone says, the lecture is going to be at 1 p.m., okay? You know what that means. That's a, an agreed upon idea that we're gonna put this label 1 p.m. on when things happen in the universe. So that's the time coordinate T. But Minkowski says that's separate from what we call the proper time, here labeled tau, the Greek letter tau, and it's the proper time that we measure on our wristwatch. And he gives a formula for that, which is like Pythagoras's theorem, but different. He says that the time that is elapsed on your wristwatch, tau, obeys tau squared is t squared minus x squared, where x is how much you've moved in space. Doesn't have to be x, could be x, y, z, whatever, but you move some in space, you move some in the time coordinate. This formula tells you, rather than Pythagoras's theorem, how to calculate your proper time. And you notice something immediately right away. This minus sign is obviously different in Minkowskian geometry versus Euclidean geometry. And that's basically the reason why time and space seem so different to us. For one thing, the shortest distance path is a straight line, but the longest time path is a straight line because a straight line would have zero moving around in space, right? If you just went... Uh, well, the longest time between two vertical points here, if you had a point here and a point right above it, the longest time you could possibly experience between them would have no movement in X whatsoever. If you do move in space and then come back, you will always experience less tau, less proper time, because you always subtract away something from your interval in T. So the famous twin thought experiment, the twin paradox that says a twin goes out near the speed of light, comes back, the twin that comes back will always have aged less than the twin that just stayed put. This is not just what your clock reads. This is what you experience, including how much you age. So this is a very beautiful, elegant way of thinking about the unification of space and time in special relativity. There was a problem with all of this. The problem was that Einstein wanted to reproduce what Newton had done. Relativity was a replacement for the Newtonian picture of absolute space and time. And remember, when Newton wrote his book, the very first thing he did was say, and the force of gravity acts in this way. So F equals MA, but then also the force of gravity has the inverse square law. So Einstein wanted to say, okay, what is the correct version of Newton's law of gravity that would work in space-time, that would work in the context of relativity. And the problem is they seem to be incompatible. There's no obvious way to fit in Newton's gravity to relativity. Electromagnetism fit perfectly, but gravity was a stubborn resistor. So Einstein thought about that. He was Einstein, he thought very hard, and he hearkened back to that feature that we mentioned, that gravity is universal. And he thought about it in this way. Imagine you're in a room where there's no windows, you can't see outside, and you drop two objects, like Newton says, and there's no air resistance, so you drop a feather and a, and a hammer, maybe. 
They follow the same rate and you go, ha, oh, look, they're gravity. But he says, imagine instead that your room is not sitting on the surface of the earth, but it's in a rocket ship. And the rocket ship is accelerating and the rate of acceleration is one gravity, one G, okay? Then when you let go of two objects, to you, they will also seem to be falling at exactly the same way as if you were in a gravitational field. So Einstein extends this idea to a principle, okay? To not just an amusing observation, but to a, a deep fact about gravity, that gravity and acceleration are indistinguishable, that you can never be sure whether what is going on in your locked room is that you're in a gravitational field or you're accelerating in a rocket, okay? And that's, again, unlike electricity or any other forces. So if you or I thought of that, we would say, well, that was very clever of us. And then we would go celebrate, but he was Einstein and he kept pushing on it. And what he said was, what this must mean is that gravity is not a force living within space-time, but that gravity is a feature of space-time itself. That's why gravity is undetectable because it's just a feature of the world in which we live rather than sort of something optional that moves within it. In particular, he said that the feature of space-time that it is, is the curvature of space-time. If you think that space-time has a geometry, a la Minkowski, what about modifying that geometry? What about bending and warping it from here and there? That, Einstein was wondering, might lead to the force of gravity. So what you need is the mathematical description of geometry. And the problem was Einstein didn't know how to do that. Happily, one of his best friends from university was Marcel Grossmann, who had become an expert in geometry, who was a mathematician. And Einstein went to Grossmann and said, you got to tutor me. Is there, is there some set of equations that I need to know to think about curved space-time? And Grossmann says, yes, they were developed just last century in the 1850s. I'll teach it to you. And that's actually been, that was a hugely important event in the development historically of general relativity. Without Grossman's help, Einstein would not have been able to do it. So what is it that Grossman taught to Einstein? Well, remember there's Euclidean geometry. That's what you learn in high school. And Euclidean geometry, you may have heard, is based on postulates or axioms. The real thing about Euclidean geometry is not that he derived brand new results, because most of his results had already been derived by other people. The great thing about it was that he turned it into an axiomatic system. He wrote down some axioms and then you prove some theorems. And most of his axioms were pretty straightforward and undeniable, but one seemed a little fishy. It was called the parallel postulate. You take a little line segment, you shoot off initially straight parallel lines away from that line segment at right angles. And Euclid says, these two parallel lines will maintain a constant distance forever. Okay, so on the one hand, that seems correct, that seems right, but on the other hand, it seems rather specific, right? And so people actually tried to prove it on the basis of the other theorems, which are just about, you know, you can draw a line through any point and things like that, things you really can't even imagine being another way. It wasn't until the 1830s that people actually realized you'll never be able to prove the parallel postulate because it might not be true you can actually replace the parallel postulate with other ideas that work equally well, that give you a different kind of geometry, but are equally legitimate. Let's say you're on the surface of a sphere. You can take a little line segment at the equator. You can draw right angle, you can draw lines at right angles to it that are initially parallel, but they will eventually converge at the North Pole. So you can make that a postulate. Instead of the parallel postulate, the initial lines always stay at a constant distance, you can postulate that lines come together at a constant rate. Or you can postulate that lines diverge at a constant rate. You can build a geometry on the basis of that, and it will be a negatively curved geometry. This was the beginning of uh, non-Euclidean geometry, which turns out to be very, very useful for Einstein. But it was not enough. OK, it was not enough to really go forward because the specific replacements that were thought of for the parallel postulate were still giving you perfectly smooth, uniform geometries, either perfectly saddle shaped, negatively curved, 
with the same geometry everywhere, but lines diverging, or perfectly spherical, okay? You needed to be more general than that to make the progress you wanted to make, and that task was undertaken by Bernard Riemann in the 1850s. Riemann was already a pretty well-known mathematician, but he was still young. He was in Germany, and in the German system, you keep having to take exams and write theses in order to advance up the academic ladder. So he was at the point where he wanted to take his exam, his thesis exam, to get the license to lecture in German universities. And so he went to his advisor. His advisor was Carl Friedrich Gauss, arguably one of the greatest mathematicians of all time. Riemann gave him some examples, some, some list of possible thesis topics. And Gauss suggested that Riemann do what Riemann thought was the most boring one on the foundations of geometry, because Gauss knew about this non-Euclidean stuff, but he knew there was still a lot of work to do the general problem. What if the geometry was just warped and twisted from different places in different ways, right? What if it was a really bendy geometry? What if it was not two-dimensional? What if it was three or four or whatever dimensional? So Riemann set out to do that. So the problem is that he's faced with is, what information do I need to specify to encode the geometry of an arbitrary n-dimensional kind of space. So let's put it this way. If you know everything there is to know about the geometry, one thing you can do is calculate the length of a curve. Pythagoras's theorem helps you do it for Euclidean geometry. Minkowski's equation helps you do it for relativistic space-time. But what Riemann suggested is that you can also go the other way around. If you know how to calculate the length of any curve, then you know everything there is to know about the geometry. And he said, I know how to calculate the length of any curve in principle. It's basically, again, Pythagoras' theorem or some generalization thereof. So imagine you have a curvy path in a flat space. If you zoom in on it, the principles of calculus tell you even the most curved, not even the most curvy path, but almost any path, if you zoom in on it by enough, will look straight. And once it looks straight, you can just calculate the length using Pythagoras' theorem, okay? So what Riemann says is, in a curved space-time, if I give you a formula to calculate the length of very short straight line segments, that completely defines the geometry of the space. So you have two examples of this. You have Pythagoras' theorem for Euclidean space, and you have Minka uh, Minkowski's equation for relativistic space-time. These are both examples of calculating an interval in some kind of geometry, okay? So maybe you can just stare at these, as, as Riemann did. Riemann didn't know about Minkowski space-time, but he knew about other examples. He knew about the sphere and, and the saddle shape, et cetera. You can stare at these and say, okay, how do I generalize these kinds of relations to more general circumstances. So the pattern seems to be that on the left-hand side, you have some interval, the distance or the proper time. And on the right-hand side, you have coordinates that you're squaring and then adding together, maybe with a number multiplying them. So you could, one way to generalize that is not only to say t squared, x squared, y squared, but allow for products between them. So t times x, t times y, x times y, etc. And another way to generalize is rather than just saying you either add them with plus signs or you subtract them with minus signs, you multiply them by some number, some function of where you are. At every different point in space, maybe you're multiplying by a different number. These are two ways you can generalize this formula while still keeping the same spirit of it. So how do you do that to make it a little bit more down to earth? This is going to look ugly in this. I, I, I always say this while, when giving this talk. This is the one point where you like, have to wrap your mind around something crazy and, and let yourself think a little more abstractly, okay? So what Riemann says, we're going to stick to space time as our example because that's eventually where we want to go. Riemann says the general formula for the length of a really tiny line segment in a general geometry we'll say interval squared, either spatial interval or time interval, is some number times t squared plus some number times t times x plus some number times t times y plus some number times t times z, and then the same with xt, x squared, xy, and all the other combinations. So if you have four dimensions of space-time, you have 16 numbers you got to give me. 
the coefficient of t squared, the coefficient of t times x, et cetera. There's four times four equals 16 numbers. And Riemann is saying, if you give me those 16 numbers at every point in the space or the space time, you have completely determined the geometry. And that's true, but it's very unwieldy. 16 numbers labeled A, B, C, D, et cetera. You can do better than that. Well, the first thing we do as professional mathematicians is we define some slick notation to make our lives easier. So we have these coordinates, t, x, y, z, and we don't know. Maybe we're going to be interested in three-dimensional space times or two-dimensional spaces or 20-dimensional space times. So rather than using letters, we're going to use numbers. We're going to call all the coordinates x, and we're going to label x0 to be the time coordinate t, x1, x, x2, y, x3, z. And sometimes it won't be x, y, z. Maybe it'll be r, theta, and phi if we were going to use spherical coordinates or some crazy coordinates in a weird kind of geometry. Usually you'll have a time coordinate and you like to label that x, zero because it's kind of different than all the other ones. And then these indices, be very careful here. This is not x to the zero power, x to the first power, x to the second power. This is x, zero, x, one, x, two. These are just indices labeling which coordinate we're talking about. And you call that index value mu. That's where the Greek letters come in. Remember Einstein's equation with r mu nus, et cetera? That's where these Greek letters come from. They are labels on which coordinate in space-time we are referring to, OK? So in terms of this slick new notation, we have this formula that Riemann wants us to consider for the interval of some tiny curve coefficient of t squared, tx, et cetera. And he says, for the coefficient of each coordinate, so this is the coefficient of t squared, which is x0 squared, so that's x0 times x0, rather than calling that a, call it g00. Call the coefficient of x0, x1, g01, OK? Get a whole bunch of components labeled in this way, and we can rewrite our formula in a way that looks like it takes more symbols, but is actually a little bit more abstract and powerful. G00 times X0 squared plus G01 times X0, X1, G02, X0, X2, all the way through the 16 combinations. So this set of numbers, this four by four array of numbers is called the metric tensor, G mu nu. We're gonna group them all together. It's exactly the same move that we do way back at F equals MA where we have a vector f, just put a little vector sign over it, secretly it's talking about three different quantities, the x direction, y direction, z direction. Here, we have this notation, g mu nu, which is very nice and simple and elegant, and secretly it's telling us 16 numbers, the coefficient of x0, x2, and all those different things. So let's see it in action a little bit. Here is the... Uh, formula for the time interval, the proper time as it is called, the time you personally experience along a path in Minkowski space. So the point is that we can re-express this formula by saying that there's a coefficient to t squared, there's a, which is plus one. There's a coefficient to x squared minus one, et cetera. There's also a coefficient to t times x. It's just zero. So we didn't write it down. So g mu nu is a four by four array or a matrix G00 or GTT, you can label it either way. That's plus one. GTX is zero, et cetera. Okay, so you get this little matrix. It's nice and pretty and diagonal. In this case, in other cases, it will be more complicated. So why do you need this extra complication? Because these different parts of the metric tensor are going to become physically relevant. If you look at just the spatial parts, GXX, XY, XZ, et cetera, those are what go in to tell you the length of curves in the space part of space-time, literally the distance you travel. The TT component of the metric, the zero, zero component, think about what it's telling you. It's saying here's tau squared, here's T squared. GTT, which is the coefficient there, is telling you the relationship between the time you experience and the time coordinate on the background space-time through which you're moving. So it's the rate at which time flows as measured by that time coordinate, whatever that time coordinate happens to be. And then weirdly, you have the, the possibility of something mixing together time and space. 
okay, GTX, GTY, GTZ would be relevant if the time coordinate and the space coordinate were somehow scissoring together. And you might say, well, that's weird. I don't need that. This is what Einstein probably was thinking. Like, when would that ever happen? I've never seen time and space become twisted together in my experience, except you have if you've seen the movie Interstellar. Interstellar features, among other things, a gigantic spinning black hole. And it turns out that to describe the space-time metric around a spinning black hole, it is crucially important that you take advantage of that possibility of time and space tilting toward each other. That's what happens when you have a black hole that is spinning to beat the band, okay? So you can do things like make this picture. This is the famous image of the uh, gargantua black hole from Interstellar. This image was not easy to make. You have to trace all of the paths of rays of light near this spinning black hole. And that metric with all the twisting was very, very important. It ended up, this picture ended up inspiring a refereed scientific journal publication in the journal Classical and Quantum Gravity that was a collaboration between Kip Thorne, famous general relativist, Nobel laureate at Caltech, and three people who were working for the special effects company that made this image. They worked really hard together on tracing the paths of photons through this curved relativistic geometry. So it can actually be useful and it might even affect your life. Okay. But it's not, so this metric, here it is, the metric tensor. This is the central object of focus in general relativity. But it's not really what is supposed to give us gravity, remember? Because Einstein didn't say the geometry of space-time is gravity. He said the curvature of space-time is gravity. So how do you characterize the amount of curvature? So it turns out there's a tensor that does this. And the reason why you need a tensor to do it is because there's a huge amount of information involved in specifying the curvature of a four-dimensional space-time geometry. And that's going to be captured by something called the Riemann curvature tensor, R lambda rho mu nu, four different indices. This is where it gets very intimidating, but it's actually pretty simple to conceptually understand what's going on. Think back to the parallel postulate discussion, right? We said you have an initially parallel line, shoot off two angles, initially straight line segment, shoot off two initially parallel lines. Do they stay constant distance? Do they diverge, converge? So what Riemann says is, imagine doing that at every point in space-time separately. And imagine doing it for every possible orientation of the initial line segment. And imagine doing it for every possible direction we shoot out these parallel lines. And imagine that not only can they either remain constant distance or converge or diverge, they can also twist around each other in different ways. Clearly, you need a lot of information to specify exactly what's going to happen. That's what the Riemann tensor provides you. You tell me where you are, what your initial line segment is, how you shoot out these initially parallel lines, plug it into the Riemann tensor, and it spits out how these lines will change in their relationship to each other as time goes on, as you move down the path. And I don't want to downplay the complexity here. R lambda rho mu nu. What, what does this look like in practice, right? Uh, in space time, we have vectors just like we have vectors in space, but because there's four dimensions, we can think of a vector like momentum, for example. We can think of it as four components. There's momentum in the time direction, which we call the energy. That's what energy is, by the way. It's just momentum in the time direction. We have momentum in the x direction, the y direction, the z direction. So a single vector in space time is written p mu, and that mu says t, x, y, z. The metric tensor has two indices, so it is a four times four equals 16 element array or matrix. But the Riemann tensor is a four by four matrix of four by four matrices. Or in other words, it is a four by four by four by four matrix. That's 256 entries. Here we've written them all out. I don't think there are any typos, but hopefully you can't find any. And this is just this is just showing off. This is not really helpful or relevant. It's just pointing out that this very compact notation of the Riemann tensor conveys an enormous amount of information. Less information than it looks like because in fact there are mathematical relationships between a lot of these components, but still, there are a lot of components, there's a lot of oomph, a lot of information you need to specify to talk about how space-time is curved. 
That's not surprising. But Einstein bit the bullet and learned all this stuff and put it together to make a theory of gravity. So how do you do that? Well, go back to Newton. Here's Newton's equation for gravity. Acceleration is Newton's constant times the mass of the object divided by the distance squared. So we're going to need to replace both the left-hand side. We're going to replace acceleration with something having to do with space-time curvature. And also the right-hand side. We're going to replace capital M because capital M is the mass, and you already know that relativity changes the notion of what you mean by mass a little bit, right? E equals mc squared implies that mass is a form of energy. So mass, just like space and time are unified together, mass is unified with other forms of energy, with heat and momentum and stress and strain and all of those things. And these are all grouped together to make something called the energy momentum tensor. Unsurprising that it would be a tensor. This is how geometry works in the modern era. So T mu nu, again, it's a four by four array of numbers, the energy momentum tensor. And you should think of this as basically every single kind of energy-like thing you've ever thought of is described by this energy momentum tensor. The T zero zero component, T T T component, because T equals X zero, is just the energy, including the mass. It's just the energy of an object sitting there. So honestly, if you're doing general relativity in our solar system, where what really matters are the mass of the planets and the sun and things like that, T00 is all you will ever need. But there are other circumstances. Maybe you're doing cosmology where you have radiation filling the universe or dark energy or something like that. These other diagonal components, TXX, TYY, TZZ, these turn out to be the pressure exerted in some kind of fluid, right? So there's pressure pushing in the X direction, the Y direction, the Z direction, those are TXX, TYY, TZZ. And the off diagonal elements are everything else. The momentum, the heat flow, the stress. If you take like a, a solid object or an object of uh, rubber or something and twist it, there's stress in there that also is encompassed in the off diagonal elements of the energy momentum tensor. So the point is, why am I telling you all this? The point is the energy momentum tensor is the right way of talking about energy and momentum and mass and all those other things in the context of relativity. And we want to make a new theory of gravity. So on the left-hand side of some new equation, we know we have a metric. That's what tells us the distances. And you can use the metric to calculate the Riemann tensor. I forgot to say this explicitly, but the Riemann tensor isn't separate and in, in, independent from the metric. There is a formula that lets you calculate the Riemann tensor once you know the metric. Okay, So there's no more information in the Riemann tensor than there is in the metric. And that Riemann tensor is responsible for space-time curvature. And then you want to relate that following, you know, being inspired by the Newtonian example, you want to relate that to mass, which means in the relativity context, relating it to the energy momentum tensor. So to replace Newton's equation, somehow what we want is an equation that relates the Riemann tensor, representing the curvature of space time, to the energy momentum tensor, representing stuff, matter and energy and all that stuff. We instantly see a problem just by looking at this. T mu nu is a four by four matrix. R lambda rho mu nu is a four by four by four by four matrix. They're different kinds of beasts. They're different kinds of objects. We can't just set them equal to each other or proportional to each other. The obvious strategy is to somehow cut the Riemann tensor down to size, to boil it down to a, a tensor with two indices and set that proportional to T mu nu. So that's what Einstein set out to do. And in fact, happily for him, a lot of the mathematical heavy lifting had already been done by previous mathematicians. Turns out you can distill other lower rank tensors from the Riemann tensor. You have the Riemann tensor with four indices. You can boil it down to something called the Ricci tensor. And it's not the same. You're losing information when you do this, but you can define a two index tensor called the Ricci tensor. And you can even keep going and defining a single function of space time called the curvature scalar. And you want to say, OK, how do I put these to work to make a good equation for gravity? Again, there's an obvious suggestion staring you in the face. Here's the Ricci tensor. It has two indices. Let's just set it proportional to the energy momentum tensor. 
If that's a thought that you had, then congratulations, you are as smart as Einstein, because he had the same thought, but it turns out not to work. It turns out to violate the law of conservation of energy in a subtle way. So instead, you have to work harder. That's why you do need to be Einstein. You have to find out, is there some combination of these things that we can add together to set proportional to the energy momentum tensor? And you know the answer, because you've already seen it. The answer is the Einstein equation, r mu nu minus one half r g mu nu equals eight pi g t mu nu. That's what Einstein's equation is trying to tell you. It is a specific four by four array on the left-hand side of the equation characterizing the curvature of space-time set proportional. And you see, once again, Newton's constant of, of gravity here set proportional to the energy and momentum that is sourcing the curvature of gravity. Great. All you need to do is now solve this equation like Newton did to get the elliptical orbits of the planets. The problem is, yet another problem instantly raises its ugly head. This is really complicated. So just to give you an idea, I have written out that formula, the Riemann tensor in terms of the metric tensor, right? I told you there was a formula. Here is a formula for one component of the Riemann tensor, R0102, written out in terms of the metric and derivatives of the metric tensor. So look, this is just to scare you a little bit. When I was a kid, we had to calculate the Riemann tensor by hand. These days, you have computers to do it. In fact, you can tell by the different font that I did not actually type this in myself. This is the output of a computer program, OK? But it is intimidating enough that Einstein himself thought, you know, uh, this is never going to work. I'm never going to get an exact solution to these equations. They're too complicated. But he worked very hard to find approximate solutions. That's how he could predict the deflection of light, the orbit of Mercury, things like that. But he was convinced that his own equations were just too difficult to be exactly solved. Happily, not everyone agreed. This is Karl Schwarzschild, a fellow German physicist who was actually fighting in World War I at the time. Think about what time, talk, time uh, era we're talking about here. Schwarzschild was working in the German army calculating the trajectories of artillery shells at the Eastern Front with Russia. But he got some time off, so he traveled back to Berlin, and he sat in on lectures given by Einstein on general relativity. And he said, I could do this. So he goes back to the front, and he solves Einstein's equation in a very crucially important situation, the gravitational field outside a star. Now, the gravitational field or the curvature or the metric, if you like, outside a star is on the one hand crucially important. On the other hand, it's relatively simple to solve the equations because it's only relatively simple, it's still hard. But number one, there's no stuff outside, right? You can actually set t mu nu equals zero because you're not solving the equations inside the star. You're only solving them outside where space is empty. And the other is the whole thing is spherically symmetric. You're not looking at a spinning star or anything like that. You're not looking at spindles, you have a, a sphere. So rather than using good old Cartesian coordinates x, y, z, you use spherical coordinates r, theta, phi. And Schwarzschild plugs into Einstein's equation, and he gets this solution. This is a metric tensor for the empty space outside a star called the Schwarzschild metric. The reason why these two components, r, r, and theta, theta, sorry, this is actually theta, theta, and phi, phi, but the point is, they're not doing anything. They're just reflecting the fact that we're using spherical polar coordinates rather than Cartesian coordinates. All of the action is in these two coordinates up here, the time-time component and the space-space component. And you can see, you can sort of think about what these equations are trying to tell you. As r gets large, as the distance gets really big, 2gm over r goes to zero, and this number is just one. Likewise, this number is just minus one, and you just get Minkowski space back. This is telling you that far away from the star, space-time looks like Minkowski and there's no gravity. That's reassuring. But when 2g when 2gm over r approaches one, this component approaches zero, and this component is one over zero, which is infinity. What is going on with that? No one knew what was going on with that. Schwarzschild and Einstein both went to their graves not knowing what was going on with that. We know the answer is it is predicting the existence of a black hole. Remember that G00 is the rate of passage of time 
of your proper time with respect to the time coordinate. If you just plot this function, it dips to zero at r equals 2gm. That's telling you that if you visit the event horizon, as we call it, of a black hole or very close to it, and then you come back, you have experienced much less time than people who stayed behind, even if you weren't moving near the speed of light. Again, no one has done this, except for Matthew McConaughey did it in the movie Interstellar, so you can check that out. He ends up being younger than his daughter because he hung out near a black hole. This was all amazing. It took decades to figure out. It wasn't until the 1950s that people really understood that there were black holes. It wasn't until the 60s that they became convinced they should probably be real. Now we're taking pictures of them. This is an image from the Event Horizon Telescope of the black hole near the center of our Milky Way galaxy. And that is the best possible place I can end this talk because that is the payoff. That is the culmination. The idea is that the equations are much smarter than we are. That's why the equations are worth studying. Einstein wrote down his equation. He didn't know about black holes, but there they were. They were implicit in his equation and not only black holes, gravitational waves, the expansion and origin of the universe, dark matter and dark energy, the growth of structure over time. All of this was there in Einstein's equation. That's why it's worth thinking about it a little bit even if there's some Greek letters involved, the uh, appreciation of how our universe works is worth that effort. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean, for uh, that uh, great uh, talk on Einstein's equation. Um, I think we have a little bit of time for some questions, maybe one or two. Uh, some of these questions are maybe uh, quite expansive, uh, no pun intended. <laughs> but um, I want to start off with a light one. Uh, maybe this is out of left field, uh, which is uh, kind of uh, this uh, thought experiment. But I've heard through my uh, research that you're a fan of Boltzmann brains. Um, I am. What, what's going on with Boltzmann brains? <laughs> well, there's a long story there that I'll try to boil down. But Boltzmann, Ludwig Boltzmann, Austrian physicist in the 1870s, was the one who first understood the, the notion of entropy and its relationship to statistical mechanics. People had already invented entropy, but they didn't realize that there were these things called atoms. And so Boltzmann explained that entropy could be explained by the number of ways you can rearrange atoms. And he explained basically what you and I call the arrow of time, why the past is different from the future, okay? But there's an assumption that you need to explain the arrow of time, which is that the early universe starts with low entropy. And nobody knew why that should be the case. And in fact, we still don't know why it should be the case. We just sort of assume that it's true and go on from there. But Boltzmann said, you know, what if the universe is like a box of gas and there's just random fluctuations all the time? If you wait long enough, the whole box of gas will fluctuate into some very, very rare low entropy configuration and then expand back. And that's where we can live. He, was, he knew enough about entropy to realize that you need increasing entropy for life to form. The problem with that scenario, a universe that is eternal in time and randomly fluctuating configurations, is that yes, you will make a universe, but far more often than that, you will make a single observer, okay? The overwhelming majority of observers that will come into existence in this randomly fluctuating cosmology are all by themselves. If I fluctuate into existence, there's no reason for my friends to fluctuate into existence at the same time. In fact, you don't even need like a body or anything like that. You could just be a disembodied brain, just conscious enough to look around and go, huh, thermal equilibrium all around me and then die. <laughs> and so you don't want that as a cosmologist. So cosmologists in the modern era have the challenge of avoiding predicting cosmological models or building cosmological models that predict most observers are Boltzmann brains. And it can be done, but it's just something to keep in mind. Okay. No, well, thank you very much for that explanation. Um, in your book, um, if I'm understanding the concept of your book, you're explaining uh, very complex uh, concepts and the equations uh, to people that are interested and um, in recent news, there has been a uh, physics Nobel Prize given out uh, challenging some of those uh, concepts uh, that we understand today. Can you go into, um, I know you have, some, uh, you have a lot of background in uh, quantum physics. Can you go into a, a little bit of uh, quantum entanglement and how this may 
these new discoveries may change how we see these models in uh, the future? Sure, I will warn potential readers that book one of the trilogy is all about classical physics, but there will be a book two where I talk okay. about quantum entanglement. And I wrote a previous book with no equations in it that talks about entanglement a lot. The idea actually was that something again, deeply hidden. Something deeply hidden. Yes, yes, that's right. I should do a better job of advertising my book here. <laughs> um, the idea once again comes from Einstein. You know, Einstein has this bad rep reputation, like he got old and couldn't un keep up with the modern quantum revolution. But that's just not true. Einstein always understood quantum mechanics as well as anyone. And he was the first to appreciate in 1935 the importance of entanglement. The idea is if you have like a little spin, a little spinning particle. So one remarkable feature of quantum mechanics is you can put the spinning particle into a combination of spinning clockwise and spinning counterclockwise. If you measure it, you will only see one or the other. But when you're not measuring it, it really is both at the same time. It's called a superposition in quantum mechanics. So there's a weird mismatch between how we describe things and what we see when we measure them. That's one thing. The other thing is if you have two spinning particles, the superposition you can put them in is not separately the superposition of particle one and particle two. It's the combined superposition. So you, they could be in a superposition where either both spins are up or both spins are down, but there's zero chance that one is up and one is down. OK, that is an allowed superposition. And we call that entangled, because if you measure the spin of one particle, you don't know what you're going to get. It could be up or down. But if you measure the spin of one particle, you instantly know the spin of the other particle because it's the same. And this bugged Einstein because he said, look, I could take one particle and I could move it very, very far away before I do the measurement here. And then I do the measurement here and somehow the other one instantly knows what its spin is supposed to be. So that's what he called spooky action at a distance. And he was sure there ha had to be a better explanation. He recognized that it would happen, but he sure, was sure there would have to be a better explanation. And so John Bell was a physicist at CERN who proved in the 1960s that either, if you want to reproduce the predictions of quantum mechanics for experiments like that, either you had to violate locality somehow you had to like invent new variables that sort of were instantaneously transmitting information or you just had to have quantum mechanics you just had to believe the spooky action at a distance and there were strict predictions of bell's theorem and the nobel prize went to three physicists who were experimenters bell himself has passed away and they don't give nobel prizes to people who pass away so the experimenters actually tested bell's predictions based on einstein's predictions and they come out spot on Mm -hmm. So in some sense, they're not changing our view of quantum mechanics. They were what Einstein predicted in 1935. But they are driving home the need to really take quantum mechanics seriously. And we haven't always been doing that in the 20th century. So I think the 21st century will be a very different place. Thank you very much. Um, I don't think we have uh, time for another question. But I just want to say thank you for joining us here uh, at Google uh, to talk about your uh, newest book. And uh, I'm looking forward to um, reading the rest of it, but then also exploring um, something deeply hitting because I uh, it sounds like those have uh, that book has a lot of cool concepts as well. If you like your quantum mechanics, that's the one to get. Yep. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us and uh, catch you all on the next talks at Google. Thanks, everyone.